we'll start. So I'm going to start with something at the beginning of the Parsha, and then something at the end of the Parsha. So it says, that's page 774. Yeah, Ba'alosha. Daber el Aaron v'amarte elav. Speak to Aaron. And say to him, Ba'aloscha etaneros, when you go up to light the candles, light the menorah, el mufanei menorah, face the menorah, ya'iru shiva etaneros, you should light seven candles. So Rashi writes, here, Loma nismacha parshas ha menorah le parshas ha Why do we have the topic of the menorah next to the topic of the nisim, next to the topic of the of the leaders of the tribes who brought their gifts to the tabernacle, to the Mishkan. That was at the end of last week's Parsha. Remember we discussed that we have 12 times the Torah writes the gifts that the head of each tribe brought to the tabernacle, brought to the Mishkan. So right after that, we have the Parsha of Menorah. We're discussing the Menorah that existed in the Temple. Why is that? Right? The Torah just doesn't put two things next, next to each other unless there's a reason. So Rashi writes, Lefi Aaron when Aaron saw the inauguration of the Mishkan with all of the heads of the tribes, he became sad. He didn't participate in it. He didn't participate in it, nor did his, um, did his tribe participate in it. Hashem told him, Yours will be greater than theirs. Because you will light the menorah. So, the reason that we have this Parsha next to that Parsha, Rashi says, is because they were very upset. The Aaron was very upset. He didn't get a chance to bring a korban, to bring a sacrifice in the inauguration of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. So, he was very upset. So, Hashem says to him, don't worry. You're going to have to get to do the menorah every day. And so, you should feel better. So, the Rabban asks on this. Vlon is barley. So, he doesn't understand Rashi here. Lama nichemu bahadlaka saneros. Why did Aaron feel better from the fact that he would get the opportunity to light the menorah every day? There's other things that were done in the temple every day. For example, the katoras the Kohen did. The incense. The incense. They were brought in the morning and the evening. In fact, the incense are very powerful. The incense is said when you bring them properly in the temple, they prevent plagues from happening to the Jewish people. In fact, during Corona, many people were learning about the incense as a merit that the plague shouldn't affect them. Corona shouldn't affect them. So you have other things. Shivu Ba'akazav, you see Ketoros Lefecha, the Torah talks about how important the Ketoros is. Not only that, all the sacrifices, all the sacrifices were done through Aaron and the other Kohanim. Not only that, he, he, was, he did the Avod on Yom Kippur, the service on Yom Kippur. He was the only human being in the world who's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, Aaron. So he had all of these great things. And he was the holiest person, one of the holiest people. Why is it that it was specifically, so the Ramban is asking in Rashi, why specifically was it but the menorah that Hashem gave to Aaron to make him feel better? So he writes like this, So what this Medrash is coming to teach us, remez min aparsha, to al-chanukah shal neirush ha-haisu b'bayi sheni, al-yidei Aaron huvanov, r'tzarni leimer, chashmanai k'ran gadol huvanov. Because there's going to be another time when the Mishkan would have to be dedicated or rededicated. The temple would have to be dedicated or rededicated. You know what that is? Hanukkah. It's going to happen thousands of years from now, from then, that the temple is going to be desecrated and there's going to be a new dedication of the temple. And who were the ones that saved the Jewish people during that time? Who were the ones that fought a war and re- uh, re-sanctified the temple from the Greeks? That was Aaron's children, the Kohanim. So he says the fact that Hashem here is giving the mitzvah of the menorah in the temple is a hint to what's going to happen thousands of years from now. And not only that, the menorah is the only thing, we don't literally like the menorah that was in the temple, but the menorah is the only thing that we still have even though the temple was destroyed. The Ketoris we don't have anymore, we don't have the sacrifices, we don't have the service of Yom Kippur. The only thing we still have in some semblance is the menorah. So that's why the Ramban says that specifically I'm giving you the menorah that's going to, you, you're upset that you didn't get to participate in this dedication of the temple. In a few thousand years, there's going to be another dedication of the temple that will come about through your children. And not only that, but the menorah is going to last even after the destruction of the temple. So that's why it was specifically the menorah that comforted Aaron. That's what the Ramban says. Okay. That was the beginning of the Parsha. Now I want to go to the very end of the Parsha. Page 794. So this is something we've, we've definitely discussed this before. At the Veloshin Hara, 
that Miriam and Aaron spoke about Moshe. So let's read what happened and maybe approach it from a different angle than the way we've discussed it in the past. Hey, let's hear about Miriam. But, you know, I, I, you know, you know, I don't recall that Aaron speaking about Aaron. Right. Right. Okay, so 12 1. Yud Bez Aleph. But Tazaber Miriam, but Aaron, but Moshe. Miriam and Aaron spoke about Moshe. Al Odos Haisha Hakushis, Asher Lokach, Ki Isha Kushis Lokach. On the matter of the Kushite woman that Moshe took, because he took a Kushite woman. Now, Rashi says that was actually uh, a compliment. He took a very attractive woman, uh, inside and outside. And we're going to see exactly what was the criticism, what was the criticism that, Mo- that Miriam had, Miriam Aaron had, about Moshe. Le'omer harak ach b'Moshe dibar Hashem, halo gam bano dibar b'yishma Hashem. They said, is Moshe the only one who speaks to Hashem? We also speak to Hashem. And it says, v'ha'ish Moshe anav ma'od. Moshe was exceedingly humble. They call Hadam Asher al Pnei Hadam from every from every person who lived in on the earth. Now let's see. So Rashi writes here, Al Odos Haisha, Al Odos Gerusheha, and the fact that he wasn't with his wife. What does that mean? That once Moshe started speaking to Hashem, Hashem told him to separate from his wife, to not be with his wife anymore. So Moshe. Uh, excuse me, Aaron and Miriam, they were also prophets. So Miriam says, well, why is Moshe separating from his spouse? We also speak to Hashem. We don't separate from our spouse. And that was a criticism. Mm-hmm. So let's see. So first, let's, we've talked about what the Lashon Hara was. Uh, I just wanted to go over that again. And then I want to talk about this pasuk, what it means that Moshe was exceedingly humble. Okay. Hello, hello. Please take food this week. Okay, so the Chavetz Chaim says from here, we learn, we have to remember what happened to Miriam, right? And after this, we know that Miriam goes out and she gets Saras. And the Chavetz Chaim writes on this, Oivra Yidea Azel, Mitzvah says, someone who speaks Lashon Hara, this violates the verse of Zachor Tashir Asa Hashem Alokech Miriam. Remember what Hashem did to Miriam, Bezerach. She says, Herno Ator Bezeshen Isko Repet, Tamid Haonish Agar Lashir Asa Hashem Isbarach Tzadik is Miriam. We have to always remember what Hashem did to Miriam. Avian Shalot Dibra Ela Ba'achi. Now, what did Miriam do exactly? She spoke about her brother, Asher Avaso Kenapsha. She loved uh, she loved Moshe like herself. She raised him. Not only that, she risked her life to save him, that he shouldn't be killed by Paro when she put him in the basket and went down the river. The low Dibra Biganusa. Now she didn't say anything bad about him. All she said is Elamasha Hishva Solasharnim. She said he's a prophet like the rest of us. That's not so bad. <coughs> she didn't speak. Here he says she didn't speak in front of him, and she didn't speak in front of a lot of people. Just between her and her brother. And he didn't care. Moshe didn't care. Shinemer, how do I know? How does he know? So Shinemer, Moshe, out of the and Moshe was exceedingly humble. So we have here Miriam spoke Lush and Hara. What was it? She it was about her brother who she loved. She didn't really say anything that was terrible. She just said he's like a prophet, like the rest of us. She didn't speak in front of anybody. She spoke to her brother. And also, she loved her brother. Not only that, her brother could have cared less. Didn't care at all. Vapo Pique, nevertheless, Lo ho'iloa komase ha'tom v'nan shem v'saraz al zeh. He says, and nevertheless, she was still punished with saraz. Kavachaymer, all the more so, the sharpening of them for regular people, hatipshim fools, he called them. Hamarvim l'davir g'dolot v'niflos ala chavreim shibavadi anshu al zeh ma'od. So imagine all the rest of the people that speak real lush and horror and horrible things that people don't like, how much their punishment will actually be. Right? You see what happened to Miriam, and she barely spoke lush and horror. Imagine what would happen, what happens to everybody else. Now, an interesting, uh, I just came across this Vilna Gon. Vilna Gon is a commentary on the book of Mishlei, the book of Proverbs. So the verse in Proverbs says, Hi, say, take some food, please. Marpe lashon etzchayim v'selef ba shever baruch. A healing tongue is a tree of life. But if there is perverseness in it, it causes destruction by wind. Now, what does that mean? Zolengon says as follows, Perish. Somebody who sins with evil speech or slander, tail-bearing. What's the... How do you fix it? What's the... What's the prescription? You're just talking about prescriptions. What's the prescription for Lashon Hara? So, you did something with your speech... So you have to do a mitzvah with your speech. What is that? Sheidaber tamid b'Torah to always speak in Torah. You did something evil with your mouth. Now do something positive with your mouth. Speak in Torah. 
And he says, what does it mean, Shever Baruch, that it causes, it destroys the wind, destroys the Ruach? Because the Ruach doesn't just mean wind, but Ruach is part of the Neshama. The ruach is part of the soul. It's specifically the part of the soul which is associated with speech. It's how you express yourself, express your personality. And he says, Ki Ruach Hua Iker HaMevi Lide Mitzvah. The Ruach, that part of your soul, is the main part that leads a person to do a mitzvah. We have a desire to do mitzvahs, a spiritual part of us. We have a body that wants to not do mitzvahs, and we have a, a soul that wants to do mitzvahs. So he says the ruach is the ikr, the main part that causes it to do mitzvahs. I'm not sure how that relates to the neshama, whatever. But someone who uses destruction with his speech to speak lashon hara, who he doesn't just do a sin. It's very interesting what the Vilna Gaon says. Who shoveres haruach ve'enumis avaod ledvar mitzvah. He destroys that part of his soul, and he doesn't desire to do mitzvahs as much. He doesn't desire to do mitzvahs. So imagine that when you, so a person speaks Lashon Hara, not only is he doing a sin, but he's destroying that innate desire that he has to do mitzvahs. Every Jewish soul, we have a desire to do mitzvahs. The Vilna Gaon says when you speak Lashon Hara, it's so destructive to the neshama that it, puts a, it dampens that desire to do mitzvahs. Very dangerous thing. So something to think about next time we're tempted to speak Lashon Hara. Now, I'd like to speak. What does it mean? Pusik, very short Pusik here. No, it's very short. Ra'ish Moshe Anav Ma'od. The man Moses was very humble, exceedingly humble. Mikola Adam Asha'af Anei Adama. From all the people who were on the earth. So, the Ramban says three explanations of Moshe's humility, which I think we can learn out different uh, aspects of humility and how to work on it. How do we become humble? Humility, we'll see, is one of the greatest attributes that a Jew can aspire to, that any human can aspire to. So the first thing the Ramban says, but Ish Moshe of Mode, how did Moses' humility express itself? Why does first of all, why does the Torah speak about his humility? He says, Because Hashem was zealous for because he was humble. He never ever answered on if somebody was saying something bad about him. If someone was trying to fight with him, he never responded, ever. That's, how, that's, how, that's one way that Moses' humility expressed himself. In fact, the Ramban doesn't bring this, but there's a Gemara, the Gemara in Chulun says, <speaking in Hebrew> The world only exists for people that keep their mouth quiet during a fight. Someone comes up to you and insults you in public, and you don't respond, that's such a holy act that the world exists for those types of people. You know, we usually associate holy acts, which they are, wearing tefillin, wearing a talus, davening all day, and those are definitely holy acts. But you know what else is a holy act? Someone insults you in front of everybody and you keep your mouth shut. You know how hard that is? If you can do that, if a person can do that, then he's a holy person. And, not, and it brings holiness to the world to the point where Hashem keeps the world in existence for these types of people. And that's one of the explanations of how Moshe was so humble. He never, when everyone was, anyone said something against him, he never responded. And it says in the Sifri, Rabbi Nelson, I'm up the fun of Moshe. They were, and we just read in the Chavetz Chaim where he said that Miriam didn't speak in front of Moshe. But here, there's another explanation that here, when he was speaking Lashon Hara, he did. In the Sifri, it sounds like he, they did speak in front of Moshe, and still, he did not only did he not answer, but he didn't care. He just didn't care at all. So you know, there was this, uh, the Rambam. I think I might have, I'm sure I told the story before, but I just really like the story. The Rambam, you know, the, the great Rambam, greatest scholars and Jews of all time. He was, uh, wrote many works that people didn't like for wrong reasons. And there were a lot, he had a lot of enemies. You know, now we look back at uh, big figures and, you know, we, like, you know, they're venerated for good reason. But at the time, people didn't understand sometimes what they were doing and they didn't understand their greatness and they would fight them. So one of the Rambam students wrote to him, he was very upset, there was this person who was saying horrible, untrue things about the Rambam, and he, he, the student couldn't take it, and he wrote to the Rambam, like, what should I do? I need to do something. Shut this guy up. So the Rambam wrote back, he says, who cares? He's like, I don't care about my honor. And the guy's having fun, he enjoys himself, let him have a good time, what do I care? What do I have to answer him? That takes a level to do that. Shmuel Kamenetsky, who's actually he's very sick now, he should have a Rufu Shlema. Oh, I forgot to say, this, this uh, class should be in the merit of Rufu Shlema for Pesach Devor Abbas Edel and also for Shmuel Kamenetsky. So he, he's about 100, I think he's about 100 years old now, if not 100 years old. He's sick, he needs Rufu Shlema, but he once went to a Shiva house. I told, don't ruin the story, I told him in class. 
He once went to a shiva house. And there was a young, well, he wasn't young anymore, there was a, a person there who had got, gotten kicked out of his yeshiva many years prior. And, uh, you know, for doing some bad things. And he deservedly got kicked out. So Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, elderly Rosh Yeshiva, he walks in to the uh, shiva house, and this person comes up to him and says, Hello Shmuel, and notice I didn't call you rabbi. <coughs> in front of everybody. You know what he does? Why should you call me rabbi? We're friends. And he gives him a hug. Right? Can you imagine that? I would have wanted to punch a guy in the face. <laughs> so that's the idea. To be um to be humble. Moshe didn't care when people insult when people insulted him, anything. Okay. Now there's another explanation of what it means that Moshe was humble. This is the Ibn Ezra, Mifar Shamaki, who Hayim Mavakish Gidu al Shim Adam Moshe, he did not want any positions of authority. He didn't want to rule over others. He wasn't looking to be in charge. He wanted to serve Hashem. That's what he wanted in life. He wanted to do what Hashem wanted him to do. He could have cared less. He did, he did not want to rule over people. You see other people, their whole purpose in life is to rule over others, to get positions of authority, to be... Right? You may be surprised to learn this, Aaron, especially. You know, you're, you're young, you may still be very idealistic, but most of the politicians running for office did not actually run for office because they want to make a difference. They actually just want to be in charge of people. You may be surprised, I'm sorry to disillusion you and uh, ruin your idealism, but... The fact is that most people want to get positions of authority to rule over others. Moshe was the opposite of this. He did not want any positions of authority. So the question remains, Moshe, he was exceedingly humble. So what does this mean for us? Well, I'm not Moshe. How are we supposed to do this? So the answer is, is that it takes a lifetime of work. And we'll talk about maybe a little bit how to do that shortly. Now, what, what is humility when we think about it? What is another? So there's actually, besides the great importance of being humble, there's also a prohibition to be haughty. Now, what does it mean to be haughty? This, I think people, we often make a mistake. Being humble doesn't mean we don't recognize our strengths. Right? Uh, Moshe knew who he was. He knew that he was the greatest Jew of all time. But he was still humble. Uh, how, how was that? So, Masil Hashem writes, what, well, first of all, what is haughtiness? What is gaiva? There's a prohibition to be haughty. See, A person recognizes that he has these strengths. But more than that, he thinks, I'm special because of it, and people should praise me for it. That's when the haughtiness comes into play. Let's say a person's smart. Okay, so he knows he's smart. He can see that he's smarter than other people. Now, does that make him feel that now, therefore, I'm more important than others? That's when it's haughty. When I feel I'm more important than you because I'm smarter. <clears throat> you should praise me because I'm smarter. You should show deference to me because I'm smarter. Because Let's look at it. Well, how'd you become smart? Hashem gave it to you. Now... Even if you worked hard, Hashem could take it away. You know, God forbid people get into accidents, brain damage, horrible things happen. You know, a person's wealthy, so he thinks, oh, you should give me honor. I'm very wealthy. I have a lot of money. I can do whatever I want. Honor me. Well, Hashem could take away the person's wealth in a blink of an eye. So there's no reason to be haughty. Absolutely no reason to be haughty. Everything comes from Hashem. When we recognize that and we live with that, then that's true, not not having haughtiness. But again, it doesn't mean that we don't that we feel bad. Oh, it doesn't mean you should say I'm a I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. You know, there's a, a sort of a joke that they say there's a, a certain yeshiva. I think it was Kelm that they were very into certain types of musr of ethical teachings. So they would you know a guy just got there the first day and they would they would, they would always say in musr seder oh I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. Um, I'm a nothing. And the, the guy they got the guy got there the first day and he starts saying oh I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. He's like oh you think you're so great to be a nothing? You just got here. Like, you have to work on it to become a nothing. That was the idea. But that's not what we're saying. We shouldn't tell ourselves that we're nothing. We should recognize, no, we should feel good. Hashem gave me these gifts. Per- perhaps Hashem gave a person, he's very smart, or he's a very calm person, he's a very nice person. Great. I have, Hashem gave me this, these gifts. I'm very, very grateful. Now, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to serve Hashem? But once a person starts thinking, oh, I have these gifts, and therefore you should praise me, and I should get special things, that's when there's an issue of haughtiness. Hello, hello, please take some. Uh... No, no, it's still good, still good. Still room, there's always room, there's always room. Okay. I was with my uh, with my Rashiva once, and there was a guy who wrote lies about him, and like publicly said negative things about him. So I hated the guy, I like, really hated him. And this guy was publicly a few years later. He was publicly exposed in a scandal. And it was in the news and everything. I was so happy. <laughs> so I told my Rosh Hashiva about it. I, I ran to him. I was like, Rabbi, Rabbi, look, this guy that wrote, wrote this stuff about you, look what happened to him. And my Rosh Hashiva's reaction was, Oy. 
oh, what's going to happen to his family? He's so embarrassed, he might lose his job. His reaction was that he just felt bad for the person. He didn't care about his honor. Like, so what? Like, okay, the guy wrote something bad about me. He just, like, like the Rambam, he could, he could have cared less. I was, like, you know, like, very, uh, very excited, very happy. But I would like to read here a portion. There's something called the Geritz Ramban. If you have, haven't read this, the Letter of the Ramban. It's very short, and um, I definitely recommend that you give it a read. You can get it online. It's, like, two pages long. The Ramban wrote a letter to his son towards the end of his life when he was living in Israel, and he told him, he said, you should read this letter every week. So in the letter, one of the themes that he discusses, one of the major things that he talks about is being humble, acquiring humility. I just want to read a, a portion of it. He says, the kashir tachshav as kol elah. When you think about this, tira mi borecha, you'll feel fear your your creator, but the shamer min achad, and you'll uh, be careful from sin. And when midas elah tia samech lechalkav, the kashir tisnag when you you should act with the attribute of humility, lehis boshesh mikol adam to act embarrassed from people, or bashful, sorry, the word is bashful from people. And be afraid of them, and be afraid of sin. And then, when you're humble, God's presence will dwell with you. And you'll get the next world. Now my son, someone who becomes arrogant on others, he's rebelling against Hashem when a person is arrogant. Haughtiness means you're rebelling against Hashem. Because you are glorifying yourself in the clothes of heaven. As it says, Hashem Malach Lavesh. Because who is the only one who deserves praise to be, right? Hashem, God. You think you deserve praise? Then you're stealing something that belongs to Hashem. Why should a person be haughty? If he's wealthy, Hashem Moshe Who gives wealth? Hashem. If you're an honored person, maybe you're. You have an important position in the government. Hello, Lelokim, who? That honor belongs to Hashem. Shenemar, Vaoshir, Verkavan, Milfanacha. That wealth and honor is before you. Vehech mispar, Vichvokono. How could you honor yourself in something that Hashem deserves honor? Vehim mispar, Vichachma. If you are glorifying yourself with wisdom. Meser, Safalan, Anam. Lene, Anam. Hashem takes away, can take away a person's speech. Vitam, Zikanim, Yikach. Nimsa, Kol, Shav, Lichnem, Agu. Everything is equal in front of Hashem. Since Hashem could give. And take away everything is equal in front of Hashem. Kiva Apo Mash Bil Game in his anger he can bring down the mighty. Ubertsonam Magbiashvalam and he can raise up the weak. The Khain Hishbal Atmacha, therefore a person should make himself humble, lower himself. In a secha makam and Hashem will raise him up. It says when a person lowers himself, that's when Hashem raises him up. Called Barakha Yu Banahas, he advises that every you should speak pleasantly to people, Varoshka Kafuf, your head should be bent down. And your eyes should be raised to the heavens. So your eyes should be down and your heart should be up. Um, and he, go, he goes on. And he says, every, he con- concludes that every person should be greater than you in your eyes. He says, if you've sinned and he's sinned, view it like he's sinned uh, by accident and you've sinned on purpose. And he thinks, because you know, there's, there's always something that we can find in somebody else that's better than us. And he says that's how we should look at other people. Now, okay, just can, I want to conclude with this. So how do we how do we become humble, right? So that's very nice. We have these ideas about uh, about humility and how to become humble. So there's I think two primary ways. First, well, first of all, it takes a lifetime. That's the first thing. It takes a lifetime of work. Rav Yisrael Salanter said to change a person's to change a person's character trait. To change one character trait is harder than to study the entire Talmud. So it's easier to study all the pages of the Talmud than it is to change one character trait. So two ways to do it. One is, to, first of all, is to learn about it and to make these ideas part of ourselves. It has to be done consistently. If you're going to lo- learn one book about it, I would suggest Masila Shasharim, The Path of the Just, by Rav Moshe Chaim. Masila Shasharim, The Path of the Just, by Rav Moshe Chaim Sato, who we've, we've quoted to get the ideas, to understand the ideas, but we can't just read it one time. To make a change in ourselves, we have to constantly go over these ideas again and again and again and again and again because we're human beings that were born and we have a natural selfishness. Human beings have a natural selfishness. And humility is the opposite of that. So to become humble and to combat our natural selfishness, it's ideas that have to be done over and over and over again. And the second way, which is uh, very important, is to act humble in situations that come up. For instance, if someone insults us, 
Don't answer. The more that we do that, which is very, very hard, the more that we do that, the more it will be easier for us to do that and the humility will become part of ourselves. You know, because you just came from the gym, no pain, no gain. If you don't, if you don't lift weights that are a little hard for you, right, how do you build muscle? You can't just lift weights that are easy 30 times, 30 reps. You have to do 10 reps with weights that are, you can barely make it. So the only way we can change our character traits is by doing something that's difficult for us. If we don't try something which is difficult, we're never going to grow. So again, if we really want to make humility part of ourselves, we have to learn the ideas constantly, and we have to put them into practice. There's a story, just I'll finish with this, Rav Moshe Feinstein had once, when he was older already, a brand new set of shots, a brand new set of the Talmud. Rav Moshe used to tell a story, and he like, wanted it very much. He was very excited about it, and he had an inkwell, you know, old school inkwell. Someone walked by, knocked the inkwell all over his beautiful new shots, and Moshe Feinstein says, oh, now my Gemara has a beautiful new hue. A, right? No color. Now, I think they say that he said, you know, he, he didn't get like that overnight. He was an older person. He spent his whole life working on his anger. It's natural for a person to get angry, but the more you don't respond to those situations and say, you know what, I'm going to let it go, the more that attribute and humility enters a person and becomes part of ourselves. So we can learn from Moshe. Moshe on of Moed, he was exceedingly humble. He wasn't born like that either. He had to work on it. We all have to work on it. And uh, we should just take this as an inspiration to do our best. And to it's part of being a Jew. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.